Hello everyone, I'm Kira Ember, uh, and I'll be presenting safe recipes for non-human identities to you all today. So let's get started. I'll do a quick introduction. Uh, so I'm a Western Dragon Otherkin slash Theriumyth, or Theriumythic, however you like to say it, and that's a doodle of me over on the right. I'm also Andalite, Cheetah, and Domestic Cat-Hearted. And I've been present in the online communities, uh, mostly Therian and Otherkin, since around 2009. I've worked as a chef or in general food service for around seven years. I'm not actually currently doing any food service stuff. Uh, I haven't done that for a number of years. Um, actually, I'm going to grad school right now, so I'm a little bit busy. But cooking and baking are still some of my favorite hobbies. And I absolutely love unusual foods and unique recipes. So you can uh, find me browsing niche websites and you know looking for these interesting foods and you know new recipes to try all the time. Um, so some of my favorite identity-related dishes are rare steak, roasted chicken, uh, things like liver, fish, venison, etc. You know, things you'd sort of expect a dragon to want to eat. Um, also, weirdly enough, I really enjoy eating grapefruit uh, to satisfy some of my kin-type urges. I don't know why, but I just really satisfies me for whatever reason. Um, also, interestingly, uh, my hearted identities don't really have any cravings associated with them. So, you know, whenever I'm looking for foods to, you know, explore with my identity, it's really only focused on dragonkin things. All right, so I'd uh, like to uh, post this disclaimer. Um, everything I'm presenting here follows U.S. food safety guidelines, and I've been food safety certified in the past through my work. Uh, however, I'm not an expert. I'm not a professional. So, you know, make sure you're consulting professional resources if you're concerned about food safety or unusual ingredients um, or, you know, you have a question that I can't answer or you're not comfortable bringing up to me today um, or, you know, via email or whatever. Um, and I will post some useful resources at the end of the presentation and in chat at the end um, so you have links to, you know, some reputable resources. Um, also, I'd like to point out that the information in this presentation is all going to be U.S. centric. So, you know, if you're not from the U.S., your home country may have slightly different food safety guidelines and your uh, available local ingredients will probably vary. So here's a quick overview of what to expect with the presentation. Now, we'll start out with exploring identity through food. Um, you know, some reasons why that's a great way to do so. Um, some uh, food and kitchen safety basics. And then uh, moving on to kitchen basics for those of you who haven't you know made it into the kitchen yet um, some safe alternatives to inedible foods you know that humans really can't eat um, then i'll do a few demonstrations and provide some recipes with those demonstrations i'll uh, link those resources that i mentioned and we should have time for some question and answer uh, hopefully through chat and through voice if possible um, for the last 15 minutes of the panel so feeding your identity through food. Why focus on food? Why not focus on, you know, something else? First of all, uh, everyone has to eat whether we like it or not. And, you know, so why not enjoy it and explore our identities while we're at it? Also, food is cultural. You know, it's a great cultural exchange tool. And humans do it all the time through local and regional dishes. And just about every family I know has some sort of family cookie or soup or whatever recipe that they've passed down through the generations. Uh, for you fiction kin, fictives, etc., sharing and exploring your cultures through food is a really neat tool, too, uh, especially when your culture doesn't exist on this version of Earth, or, you know, it only exists on another planet. Now, there are also so many options when it comes to what you eat, and unlimited ideas for new foods to try when you're feeling like what you're eating really isn't cutting it anymore. So, you know, infinite things to try, new things to explore, it's just, you know, it's new and exciting, and it's great. Uh, also, not, you know, not always, but food is often cheaper than buying gear, especially if you're going for nice gear uh, to represent your identity or feel more in tune with your identity. And it's a really great option when you're low on money or you're not willing to spend money on gear. Uh, finally, you know, knowing how to cook, it's a great skill to know. It's a great skill to practice because you can feed yourself, you can keep yourself healthy if you're making healthy dishes. You can also feed your friends and your family and you can really get people, you know, interested in what you're doing. So let's move on to some food safety things. So now we're kind of getting to the boring part of the presentation, but bear with me, this stuff is really important, especially if you've you know never dealt with things in the kitchen or you don't really know much about food safety. Um, so if you plan to cook on a regular basis, you know, and especially if you plan to cook for other people, 
Knowing how to prepare and store food safely is essential so you and your friends and family don't get a nasty round of food poisoning and you feel comfortable handling things like hot pans and sharp knives. Uh, so some of the information in the next couple sections may be a little bit basic for some of you, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page before we keep going. So like you can see here, there are four main tenets of food safety. Clean, separate, cook, and chill. So step one, clean. Make sure you're washing your hands before you're cooking um, and you know, make, make sure you're keeping everything clean. Um, so washing your hands and keeping things clean before you're cooking can prevent you and those you're feeding from getting foodborne illnesses. Now you also want to make sure that you're washing your fruits and veggies. Nothing ruins a meal like eating salad um, you know, with sand in it that's trapped in the leaves because you didn't wash your food. Uh, and washing also limits the pesticides and herbicides you're consuming on produce, which is you know, good for your health. Finally, wiping down your kitchen counters, dishes, utensils, etc. will keep nasty things like, you know, pet hair, dirt, old food, whatever, uh, you know, keeps those from sneaking their way into your food. Step two, separate. So make sure you're not mixing raw and cooked food. When raw food that's intended to be cooked and fully cooked food come into contact with each other, it's called cross-contamination. And essentially, when raw eggs or raw meat or, you know, fruits and veggies that need to be cooked before eating um, touch foods that are fully cooked and ready to eat right now, those cooked foods can pick up bacteria and chemicals that can, you know, make you pretty darn sick. And that's really not a great situation, but it's really easily preventable. So uh, if you make sure you're using separate cutting boards, dishes, and utensils for cooked and raw foods while you're cooking, this won't happen. And also making sure you're not dripping raw juices everywhere and wiping everything down, making sure you are wiping everything down between recipe steps if you're dealing with raw and cooked foods, that'll keep everything safe. So step three, cook. Uh, making sure that you're cooking risky foods that may contain bacteria like, you know, that meat and seafood or eggs that I mentioned. Making sure you're cooking those thoroughly is really important because proper cooking temperatures will kill those nasty bacteria that can make you sick. And a great kitchen tool to get used to using is a kitchen thermometer that'll, uh, you know, let you know that your food is at a safe temperature and, you know, it's kill all, the all that bacteria. And, you know, when you're going to do that, um, just make sure you're inserting your thermometers into the thickest part of the food and make sure the thermometer isn't poking out of the other side because you're going to be measuring the temperature of your pan and not your, your food. Make sure things like chicken and other poultry or, you know, other, other birds are cooked to at least 165 degrees Fahrenheit or 75 degrees Celsius. You know, chicken is really one of those dangerous meats that can get you really sick with salmonella or E. coli, kind of gross stuff. And then meat like beef and pork, you know, especially for you carnivorous folks out there, um, that can actually be cooked to lower temperatures. But, you know, if you want your meat rarer, let a professional chef handle it. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Finally, step four, chill. Uh, so refrigerate things, keeping food under 4 deg degrees Fahrenheit and or 4 degrees Celsius, that's a typo, sorry, uh, helps slow bacteria growth. So that nasty bacteria that can get you sick, if you keep it chilled, it's going to uh, grow a lot slower and your food will keep uh, for longer. Um, and most home cooked foods should be stored in the refrigerator. Um, there are some exceptions to this, like baked goods, like, you know, bread and brownies. But, you know, if you're making stir fry or you're making pasta, throw that in the fridge when you're done. Okay, so a few other general food safety tips. Um, make sure you're thawing frozen food in the refrigerator, not on the counter. You know, like I mentioned that, um, that cold zone, that's, you know, as long as you keep food under that temperature, it'll be safe. Uh, when you're thawing things on the counter, it might still be frozen, but not all of it may be frozen, and you can, you know, let bacteria grow that way. Um, also, toss those leftovers if they're more than like a week old or if they start to smell. You know, at that point, you know it's not safe to eat, and just don't risk it. Um, something else that I, you know, don't see mentioned very often is make sure you're checking your heat ratings on your cookware, uh, especially things like utensils like spatulas, because I can't tell you how many spatulas I've melted because I didn't bother looking. Um, so most of these utensils and, you know, dishes will give a temperature rating or say they're oven safe or microwave safe. You know, that means that, you know, if it's oven safe, you can use it in the oven or microwave safe, you can use it in the microwave and it's not going to melt on you. Um, but when in doubt, you know, if you don't see that rating, um, or you don't really understand it, just use something else. Finally, sharp knives equals safe hands and, uh, may seem counterintuitive, but dull knives actually cause more injuries than sharp ones. 
uh, because dull knives will slip off food and they're a lot harder to control while you're chopping things. So you can actually end up cutting a finger, which is really not fun. Um, also take it slow. Chopping and slicing isn't a race. You're not going to impress anyone if you're bleeding. So, you know, just take it easy and, you know, do whatever you're comfortable with. All right, last important bit about food safety before we move on to common non-human and ultra-human food requests. So as I've mentioned, some things aren't safe to eat raw as a human. Um, obviously, we know eating raw hamburger is a bad idea, but eating things like raw steak and raw fish and eggs can also make you really sick. And I know 90% of you wolves out there have drooled over the raw meat section of the grocery store, and I know I have, but when it comes to raw meat and fish, just let a professional prepare it for you. So things like steak tartare, which is a dish made with raw beef, uh, and sushi, which may contain raw fish, depending on what kind of sushi you're eating, uh, can be safe to eat when prepared by a chef. Uh, but restaurants are able to source their ingredients from safe vendors, and they follow these food safety practices that make these dishes safe. Um, also mention here that eating raw flour can give you food poisoning too, even though it's not meat or eggs or, you know, an animal product at all. So keep in mind that if you want to try your hand at making something like eggless cookie dough or brownie batter or something, you know, something like that to eat, um, you know, if you want to be eating it raw, cause that's delicious, uh, make sure you toast your flour for a few minutes first and, you know, treat cutting boards and, you know, other utensils that have touched raw flour like you would something, uh, with you know, that you would use with raw eggs or raw meat. Okay, so we've gone over things humans shouldn't eat raw, and there are plenty of things humans shouldn't eat at all, but you know, how do you manage when you still want to eat them? So let's go over some fo common food requests I've seen in the community for potentially sickening or dangerous foods. And obviously this is not an exhaustive list, so if you've seen other requests, let me know. So let's start with raw meat. You know, we talked a little about this a little bit uh, already, but here's some other ideas and some more details about some safe food alternatives uh, to just chowing down on a raw steak or cracking some raw eggs in your mouth. So like I mentioned, steak tartare is a really great uh, alternative. You know, like I said, it's this, um, you know, it's ground beef. A lot of times they'll crack a raw egg yolk on top as well. Uh, it's a pretty fun dish. Uh, you can get it at um, a good number of higher end restaurants. Um, really, really tasty, really, really awesome. Um, but again, let a professional prepare this for you, you know, don't try to do this at home, you know, because you don't know where your ground beef is from necessarily or your eggs are from necessarily. Just better to let a professional do it, and then you know it's safe. Um, also, some of you may have heard of this. Uh, black and blue steak is a really good option. So it's essentially a steak that has been seared at a really high temperature, so the outside is cooked. Um, the outside can come in contact or with, you know, uh, bacteria, or it could grow bacteria on it, whereas the inside remains raw, which, you know, is a safer part of the meat. Um, so this is a really, really great option, you know, if you want raw meat, but you're not willing to risk it. Uh, but again, let a professional prepare this for you. Then this carpaccio, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly, hopefully. Um, this is a dish, an Italian dish that's thinly sliced raw beef or other meat. Um, this is absolutely delicious, and you can get it at a good number of Italian restaurants. It's pretty darn popular, but it is technically raw. Uh, but again, let a professional prepare it for you. And finally, there's irradiated eggs. So these are eggs that have actually uh, been dosed with radiation to kill the pathogens or the bacteria in them. Um, but um, they are actually safe to eat and you can uh, eat them raw because like I said, all those uh, bacteria have been killed. So moving on to bones, um, you know, this is one I see every once in a while. Uh, candy chalk is a potentially good alternative for eating bones. I mean, while it's sweet and bones are not necessarily sweet, it's still got that crunch. It's still usually white. Um, you know, it's, I we used to get these in my Halloween baskets every year, and I was like, why the heck would somebody buy this for a child? But in this situation, I feel like it could be a you know really great alternative. Um, there's also the option of making meringues in the shape of bones, and there are a good number of recipes, uh, especially Halloween-themed recipes, uh, for how to make meringues. Um, meringues are, you know, these uh, little um, sweets that are made with uh, egg white. It's just like whipped egg white, so they're crunchy, they're sweet, they're actually really delicious. Uh, there's also a dish called Hone Senbei. Uh, these are Japanese-style deep-fried fish bones. So it is, is real bone. Um, they're deep-fried and salted, so they're crunchy, they're really good. Um, they serve them at uh, bars sometimes with beer. Um, awesome way to, if you like fish, to eat bones as well. Finally, there's roasted marrow bones. So this is a dish where 
Um, you take the large bone, like bones of cows or you know other large animals, and you roast them, and you crack them, and you can actually eat the marrow from inside, and it is super delicious. Um, you know, you're not actually going to be eating the bones themselves, but you do get the experience of you know potentially eating from bones. So could be a potential alternative also. So as a dragon, of course, I'm going to be interested in rocks and gems. And, you know, although I personally am not eat, interested in eating, you know, rocks and gems, a number of dragons out there definitely are. So some alternatives are uh, hard candy gems. So, you know, things like uh, crystals and, you know, things like that that are in the shape of, you know, pretty rocks and pretty crystals that are edible. Um, those are great alternatives. Or, you know, always rock candy, you know, those, those rock crystals that um, all, you know, every candy shop sells. Obviously, those are, you know, good alternatives. Uh, a really fun one is chocolate rocks. Uh, they have some really cool chocolate rocks now that actually look legitimately like rocks. Those are really fun to even, you know, if you're not really interested in eating rocks, they're really fun to trick people with. So highly recommend those. Then if you're looking for something that's a little bit healthier and hopefully with a little bit less sugar, uh, you can actually eat pomegranate seeds. They are these beautiful crystalline looking red um, juicy seeds uh, that come out of a pomegranate. And uh, those are great alternatives as well. So cultures around the world eat insects and getting your hands on real safe insects is actually pretty darn easy. Uh, and a simple Google search will give you more online vendors that sell edible insects than you can count. Uh, so from these vendors, you can get chocolate covered crickets, roasted and seasoned mealworms, ants, all kinds of different things. Uh, but if you're not actually into eating real bugs, but want something similar, nuts and seeds are really, really great alternatives. So, you know, for really small insects, black sesame seeds or white sesame seeds do wonders. Uh, or you can, you know, try roasted pine nuts, roasted sunflower seeds or pepitas. You know, little things like that. Um, or if you want larger bugs, you can go on to other nuts that are larger, like peanuts or Brazil nuts, you know, whatever sounds good to you. So blood is a tough one because it seems like adequate sub substitutes really vary from person to person. Um, but some alternatives I've seen people mention that have worked for them include cranberry juice and tomato juice, especially if you um, let them, you know, heat up to room temperature. Um, or an interesting one is chocolate pudding thinned with warm milk. Uh, or you can make, um, you know, room temperature hot chocolate with extra cocoa in it. So it's got that really rich, like kind of irony taste. Also, you can get cow and pig's blood from your local butcher, but this does come raw and you should ex consume it with extreme caution and make sure you're getting your blood from a reputable business. Because again, it's raw, it's an animal product and it can make you sick. Garbage is a really interesting one. And I actually had a lot of fun researching this. Um, so... Um, you know, if you're potentially like an android who wants to eat garbage or a raccoon or, you know, whatever, um, making things like fried rice with miscellaneous fridge ingredients, you know, miscellaneous vegetables, uh, throw in some different meats, some different, you know, seasonings in there, just make it sort of a garbage plate, uh, as we like to call it. Uh, that's a really good option. Another good one that I thought was kind of cool was, um, you know, taking sliced apples or bananas or avocados and just leaving them in the fridge overnight um, after they've been exposed to air um, or doing that with guacamole because you know they get that brown coating on them and they look really, really gross, but they are technically safe to eat. Uh, and, and they actually, you know, it doesn't change their flavor all that much either. It just looks like they're rotten. Um, obviously make sure that your fruit is not rotten before eating it, but you know, if you leave it overnight in the fridge, it'll be totally fine. Finally, uh, pan fried cabbage leaves. Um, if you're looking for something like wet newspaper or wet paper or wet cloth, um, just taking the leaves off of a cabbage and throwing them in a pan with some oil, some salt, some other seasonings, whatever you want to make it taste good. Um, that's a great option because it looks really, really gross, but you know, it's something that would, that would actually be enjoyable to eat still. And finally, pet food. Um, this can be something, you know, for dogs or cats or, you know, whatever, like, you can also focus on gerbils or hamsters, what have you. Here I've just focused on mostly dogs and cats, but this is a really common one I see in the uh, community just because there are so many, you know, mammals out there, um, mammal identities out there. But uh, canned meat and fish, um, that's a really obvious one, you know, for dogs or cats. Um, you know, things like uh, canned beef or corned beef hash super awesome. Canned salmon's a really good one for cats or canned tuna. 
Um, then, you know, if you're not really into the canned stuff, uh, beef or pork jerky is a really good option as well. Um, you can also get turkey jerky if you're looking for something a little bit healthier. Um, or if you're, you know, you want something that's a little bit sweeter, fruit leather is a great one. You know, you can cut it up into little pieces as like dog treats. Um, or for other treats, you can do snack cookies and crackers or those little graham cracker or like bunnies or, you know, goldfish or whatever. Those are awesome. You know, if you want to have something that's like a, a pet treat. Also, if you know you want something savory that's more like a meal, but you're really not into that canned stuff, uh, mixing steamed rice with uh, gravy, you know, or you know meatballs or things like that, that's also a really good option, especially for dog food. So I've talked about all these like uncommon ingredients, uncommon you know foods that you can use, um, you know, to sort of satisfy these identities. Uh, but where do you actually get these? <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, so some of your meats, um, obviously, uh, going to your local butcher is a really, really great option because your butcher is going to know where the meat came from. Um, they're going to be super knowledgeable about the cut, um, or the different cuts that you, cuts of meat you can get, um, you know, or things like, you know, if you want some organ meat, uh, which I really personally enjoy, like hearts or lungs or livers, um, going to your local butcher, butcher, um, you know, they'll help you out with all that stuff. Uh, also, farmer's markets. Um, so this isn't just great for meats, this is great for produce as well, but uh, as far as the meats go, um, you know, you're going to have local farmers who know where their animals came from, they know how they were butchered, you know, they'd be very knowledgeable about what they have, um, and also, you know, you can get meats like lamb or goat or, you know, things that you wouldn't necessarily get in a grocery store. That being said, uh, chain stores sometimes are really good for finding cheap uh, liver, um, whether that's chicken or beef liver, um, or oxtail or, you know, things like that. Um, so I've found, uh, some really good liver and, um, like g chicken gizzards, uh, actually here at our local Walmart. Um, you know, it's a chain in the United States. Um, so, you know, some of those big box stores can actually be surprisingly good sometimes. Then looking, uh, you know, into other ingredients, um, international food stores are super, super great. Um, a lot of times, you know, like your Asian food store or, you know, Central American food store will have um, a wide variety of different ingredients. Um, and a lot of times they can be cheaper than, you know, those big box stores or your local grocery store. Um, and you can also often get bulk items like rice and noodles here if you want to stock up. And sometimes spices are a lot cheaper. Um, so it's a good place to go even if you're not looking for, you know, your non-human or alter-human identity. Then finally, specialty and health food stores are a good place to go because sometimes they'll have, you know, interesting teas or interesting blends of grains or, you know, all different kinds of things in the freezer section you probably wouldn't find anywhere else. So exploring those areas, um, talking to the staff there, um, that can really open your eyes to uh, new dishes, new foods that might help you get closer to your identity. And finally, when in doubt, just go online. You know, if, as long as you're not trying to order perishable food items, you know, as long as what you're trying to get is canned or bagged or whatever, something that can actually handle being shipped to you online is great. So, you know, I'm not a huge fan of Amazon, but, you know, I found all kinds of things there when I really can't find it anywhere else. So now that I've hopefully given you some ideas about what you can eat, let's uh, move along to how you can make them to actually eat. Uh, again, some, some of the info in the next few slides might be a little basic for some of you, but if you're bored, you can stare at my family's chili recipe for a minute or two. Let's talk about how to follow a recipe. So first things first, recipes almost always list their ingredients in the order that you're supposed to add them to the dish. And there are some exceptions, like if you have one ingredient you use twice in a dish, but that's you know kind of the general rule. And it's also a, always a great idea to prep all of your ingredients before you start cooking. So this means chopping your vegetables, opening your cans, thawing your frozen ingredients, and you know measuring your spices before you get started so you aren't scrambling to chop a carrot as your onions are burning in the pan. Um, and also don't forget about the oven. If you're making a dish that requires baking, make sure your oven is at the proper temperature before you bake your dish and everything will turn out a lot better and save you a headache. And finally, ingredients always come with a measurement in recipes, uh, sometimes in cups and tablespoons or teaspoon measurements, and sometimes by weight. And if you're using canned goods, the cans will list the weight on the, on the labels, so you don't have to worry about, you know, trying to weigh them. So sometimes recipes will list measurements as to taste, 
meaning you should add the amount of the ingredient that tastes good to you. Or sometimes they'll say add a pinch or a dash of something, which means to add a small amount of whatever ingredient they're calling for, like they do in this chili recipe. And there's not really a set amount associated with those measurements, unfortunately, but the more you cook, the better you'll get at estimating how much of those ingredients you should be adding. Uh, and then also commonly listed on recipes is how long they take to cook and how many servings they make. So you know what to expect as you make the recipe. Okay, so a few tips. Um, read your recipe once before actually beginning to cook. That'll you know help you know what to expect. Uh, so you won't have any surprises as you're going down the ingredient list or, you know, what have you. Um, also, know your measurements, especially tablespoons versus teaspoons. I, I can't, you know, tell you how many times I've uh, been about to put in a tablespoon of salt into a recipe and realize they were calling for a teaspoon. And, you know, that's never good. Um, also, for weight measurements like ounces and grams, having a kitchen scale is a lifesaver. So they're fairly cheap, um, or you can borrow one from somebody if you want to try it out really, really good to have. Finally, practice makes perfect. And don't get discouraged if your dish doesn't look like the one in the photograph of the recipe book. Wah, wah, wah. So let's move on to some food demos. Uh, the food, first food demo I'll be doing is meat hand pies. So I've uh, given this a difficulty rating of two out of five, meaning it's pretty darn easy, especially if you may may uh, especially if you buy pre-made hand pie crust. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the dish. Um, this is a little bit tougher if you choose to make your own crust, like I'll be demoing, considering pie crust can be a little bit finicky sometimes, but it's well worth it. So hand pies are essentially what they sound like. Uh, they're these little mini half pies that you can hold in your hand. And they're also commonly called pasties. So the variety we'll be making here is from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, but other popular varieties include Cornish pasties. And here this recipe includes meat, but you can easily make these vegetarian if you swap out the meat for something like Beyond Meat or tofu or some cooked lentils or cubes of cheese even. And you know, while these could arguably satisfy a lot of different identities, uh, some major ones that came to mind while I was filming this demo were dwarves, kobolds, bears, raccoons, and birds like hawks and eagles. And these uh, pasties or hand pies are hearty and meaty, and they're really good topped with ketchup, which for some or for those of you with predator identities out there, uh, could look like blood. And on the flip side, vegetarian virgin versions would be great for you know things like deer, goats, forest spirits, etc. So I'll go over some equipment that we need for this. Um, so if you're just making the filling and you've uh, used store-bought pie crusts, um, you'll need a baking sheet, a chef's knife, which is you know a big one of those big choppy knives, which you'll see in the video coming up, uh, a cutting board for chopping, a medium bowl, and a mixing spoon, or you can just use your hands for this if you want. Uh, and then if you're making the crust, you'll also need another medium bowl, a mixing spoon or a fork, and a measuring cup. So I'll go over the recipe here. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll just uh, go through the ingredients um, just so you you know, you know kind of know what to expect. Um, so if you are going to make the crust, uh, we need two cups of flour, two thirds of a cup of butter, half a cup of cold water, and a pinch of salt. And then for the filling, uh, I've uh, used uh, three quarters of a pound of, uh, well actually here I've used ground turkey, but generally it calls for ground pork. You can also use other meats as well. Then three cups of potatoes, a uh, third of a cup of carrots, third of a cup of onion, third of a cup of rutabaga or turnip. This is optional. You know, if you don't know what it is or you can't find it, like don't worry about it. Uh, and then salt and pepper to taste. And here I've actually made a little bit more filling than uh, is called for in the recipe, but I'll show you what I'll do with it in a little bit. So first of all, I'm going to start making the crust and I've added all the dry ingredients and then I'll add the butter. So for making crust, it's uh, easy if you chop the butter up so you're not trying to mash a whole stick of butter in there. And then I'm using the fork to uh, mix the butter in and you know make these uh, little lumps of butter uh, within the flour. So now uh, I've added some cold water. Um, usually use ice water for this, but my tap's pretty cold. And uh, you'll notice I'm just adding it in increments. So, you know, sometimes, you know, it's kind of hard to tell how much you actually need. So um, you can make sure by doing it this way that you're not gonna add a whole ton more water and end up making a whole ton more pie crust than you actually want for your recipe. So 
So now that that is nice and mixed, I'm gonna wrap it in some plastic wrap and put it in the refrigerator for uh, about an hour. And while that's chilling, I'll preheat the oven uh, and then I'll take our uh, filling ingredients and mix them together. So first of all, wash your vegetables, very important. And then I'll chop the onion. Um, this calls for a diced onion, which is a relatively large, well, sort of a medium chop as you'll see here. And I'll add that to the meat once I'm done. Then for the other vegetables, I'm gonna peel those. And you don't necessarily have to peel your potatoes or your carrots, but for this one, for this recipe, it um, makes the filling look a little bit nicer and uh, then you're not getting like potato peel in your in your bites. And here I'm, you know, making sure with the potato, I'm taking out all those uh, weird little black spots and, you know, eyes of the potato. All right, so I'm gonna trim all the weird ends off and then I'll chop the rest of our uh, vegetables. So again, I'm not uh, chopping them super small, but they're not in huge chunks. So uh, they're, you know, pretty much bite-sized. And uh, they're all in, you know, pretty uniform chunks. But, uh, you know, as you get better with, uh, you know, chopping with knives, you know, you'll get better at making things look a little bit more uniform. I was pretty bad when I first started. So now that everything is chopped, I'll uh, add everything together and then add a little bit of salt and pepper. Now uh, this is two taste, so whatever I you know felt was, was appropriate. And here comes the fun part. Um, I'm gonna mix everything with my hand. And you know, if you don't wanna get your hand in raw meat, which is totally reasonable, you can just use a spoon. So now that that's mixed, I will put it in the fridge. Now we're gonna roll out the pie crust. So I'm gonna cut this into four, four pieces um, because this makes four pasties or four, pa four hand pies. And uh, I'm rolling in them into balls because it makes them a lot easier to roll out into circles. So I'm not doing these super, super thin uh, because if you do them too thin, then the, uh, the pie crust will actually break and the filling will you know, kind of poke out of the holes it makes. But if you do them too thick, then uh, you won't have any room to actually put your filling in. So it's sort of a just sort of a delicate balance. But if you buy pre-made pie crusts, they're already rolled out for you. Okay, so I have everything rolled out, and now we're gonna go get our filling and start filling these uh, hand pies. And it's really, really easy to overfill these. So if you have to take filling out, that's totally okay. And you can see here I'm crimping the edges so they'll stay stay together. Um, but if you don't feel like crimping the edges, you're feeling a little bit lazy or it's you know kind of hard to do, there's actually another really good way to uh, close these up, which I'll show you in a second. So crimping them down with a fork is a great way So once I have all of these hand pies uh, sealed up, I'm actually going to take some olive oil uh, with a, a cooking brush. Um, it's essentially a clean paint brush that's never been used for anything except food. And um, I'm going to brush the tops of these. Uh, you can also do an egg wash on them, which is essentially just an egg cracked in a little bowl and mixed up with a little bit of water. And then I'll poke holes in the top uh, so they'll vent a little bit and let some of that steam out. And we'll put them in the oven. So while those are cooking, um, you'll notice that I made a bunch of extra uh, filling, and this is a really great um, you know meal that you know if you don't want to have a ton of pie crust, you know you're not interested in eating that much pie crust or whatever, uh, you can actually um, just bake the filling itself. And now you can see here we have our baked pasties or baked tan pies. Uh, the one in the upper left hand corner, it looks like the filling leaked a little bit, but that's totally fine. That's totally normal. Um, you know, kind of looks gross, but it's still great to eat. 
Um, and I really like to drizzle these in ketchup uh, and just go to town. So those are the hand pies. Okay, so we'll move on to our uh, next demo, demo number two, fried eggs and asparagus. So this is a really, really easy recipe. So I've just given it a rating of two out of five. Um, this is a really easy and healthy meal for one person. Um, the previous recipe uh, made four servings, um, but this is just a one serving recipe, but it's really easy to double or triple. You just have to you know, multiply the ingredients by however many, re however many servings you want. And this is also really cool because it takes less than 30 minutes to prepare. Most of the time, uh, you just spend waiting for the water to boil to cook the asparagus. So if you're in, you know, in a hurry, great healthy meal. So some suggestions for this uh, recipe. Um, the eggs can really be cooked however you like them. If you don't like sunny side up how I'm doing them, you can you know, do them over easy. You can poach them, you can boil them, you know, whatever sounds good to you. But I'll just show you what I'm, you know, what I like. Uh, this is also a great dish to make in the summer when it's hot outside because there's not a long cook time for it. And it's, you know, pretty versatile. You can have it for breakfast, brunch, lunch, dinner, snack, whatever, you know, whatever you feel like. So as I was making this, um, some relevant identities that came to mind would be, you know, things like foxes or bears or skunks or these, you know, omnivores who like to eat, you know, all different kinds of things. Um, or, you know, human characters or humanoids like elves or fawns or hobbits or, you know, other people from woodlands or farms, or, you know, sort of that, that general concept, that general idea. Um, or, you know, anything that doesn't want or need to eat meat, but, you know, doesn't strictly eat plants. You know, this is a good omnivores dish. So, you know, this is also pretty easy on the equipment end. Um, all you'll need here is a nonstick frying pan. Uh, silicone or a plastic spatula, just so you're not, you know, scratching that nonstick pan with a metal spatula. A medium saucepan, which is, um, you know, just a, it's a, essentially a pot, and some tongs to pick the asparagus up out of the pot with. So some of the ingredients you'll need, uh, you'll need half a pound of fresh asparagus, which is, you know, about half the size of a regular size bunch you can get here in the United States, a tablespoon of olive oil, two large eggs, some salt and pepper, and a quarter cup of Parmesan cheese, or, you know, whatever cheese you have on hand. So I'll start out here by boiling the water and rinsing off the vegetables, very important. Um, I'm actually going to uh, take the ends off the asparagus. The ends get kind of woody and kind of gross to eat, so we'll get rid of those. And while the water is uh, heating up, we'll heat up the olive oil in the pan as well. So fast forward, the water is boiling. We can actually put the asparagus in uh, in just a second. And then we'll crack the eggs into the, the pan and cook those up too. So like I said, I'm just doing sunny side up here. Um, so I'm going to salt and pepper the top and just let those guys cook for a minute. So now that the asparagus is done, we can just pull it straight out and then top the asparagus with the eggs, pour the Parmesan cheese on, and I'm gonna top it with a little bit of uh, red pepper. All right, for our final demo, we're gonna demo candy crystals. So I'm really excited about this as a dragon, I'm sure you can tell. So I'm, I give this recipe a difficulty rating of five out of five. So it's really not that difficult um, in most senses, but um, you, are, you are dealing with a really hot sugar syrup, which can be really painful if you get that on yourself. And it does require some special equipment. So a little bit about the dish. Um, as you can see in that picture, uh, this makes gorgeous hard candy crystals uh, that you can just eat straight. You can put them on cakes or you know do kind of whatever you want with them. Um, and they're great because they're super versatile and you can add whatever flavoring or colors you prefer. And it's fairly easy cleanup if you're willing to soak your dishes for a few hours because you're just dealing with sugar syrup and you know, you're not dealing with things like meat or fat or you know, eggs or anything that's gonna stick really, really bad. Uh, however, like I mentioned, watch out for that hot syrup. Uh, sugar burns are really painful, I know from personal experience. So you know, please be careful if you, you know, do this recipe. So some relevant identities that came to mind, obviously dragons, um, but things like cryptids or aliens or androids, 
even like Pokemon or video game characters who are associated with eating crystals or consuming crystals um, or ice crystals, you know, anything kind of like that. This is, you know, a good recipe for you, I would assume. And like I mentioned, there is some special equipment with this. Um, so I actually ordered some crystal uh, silicone molds from Amazon and they were pretty cheap, um, but you know, it only comes with five of them. So you can make a pretty limited uh, size batch. Um, you also need liquid and dry measuring cups. So liquid measuring cups are, you know, just these uh, clear cups that are made out of glass or plastic that have, you know, measurements, measurements on the side and, you know, makes it easy to measure that liquid accurately. And then dry measuring, measuring cups are just those scoops, you know, those big measuring scoops. Um, then you also need measuring spoons, in this case, teaspoons, a candy thermometer, which I'll show you, but it's sort of a little special apparatus for uh, making candy or deep frying things. Uh, you also need a pretty small saucepan, you know, like I mentioned previously, it's just a little pot and a rubber spatula for stirring things. The ingredients for this are actually pretty simple. It's mostly just sugar. So two cups of sugar, half cup of water, quarter cup of corn syrup, a quarter teaspoon of vanilla or whatever other flavor extract you want to add, and gel or gel paste food coloring in whatever color you'd like. Uh, so gel or gel paste food coloring is just a more concentrated version of like the, the drip food coloring that you can get at the grocery store. So I'm going to start out by uh, boiling the water and the sugar and the corn syrup together. And we actually have to let this get up to 300 degrees Fahrenheit, so that'll take up most of the time uh, in this video. So this is the candy thermometer. It's this thermometer that's encased in uh, hollow glass and has a little metal thing at the bottom to conduct the heat. Um, but it can withstand you know, these intense temperatures and it does a pretty good job of accurately measuring you know, what temperature you need to create soft candy versus hard candy. So we're just gonna let this boil for a while. It does take a long time for that, you know, temperature to actually reach 300 degrees. And you can see ab above the pot, um, you know, on the top of the screen, those are the silicone molds. They're kind of funky looking, but um, inside is that, you know, crystal shape that the sugar will take the shape of once we pour it in. So things are starting to get close to 300 degrees, so I'm gonna prep the vanilla, and in a minute I'll prep the uh, food coloring as well. So I pulled it off the heat, it's reached 300 degrees. Now we're mixing in the food coloring. Um, oh, not quite enough, we'll add some more. And here I'm actually using uh, blue and black. Um, so the black's not actually black, it's more of a really dark purple. So adding those together makes this really gorgeous, like purpley blue crystal. And I'll pour it in the measuring cup to uh, get rid of some of the extra bubbles and uh, to make it easier to pour and just pour it directly into those molds. So this does need time to cool. It takes about half an hour to an hour, depending. But now that these are cool, I'll pull them out and uh, show you how they turned out. They actually turned out pretty darn awesome. Check those out. So this does make a small batch, but um, you know if you get more silicone molds or you're willing to uh, do a few uh, rounds of sugar syrup, you can create quite a few cool candy crystals. So I'm gonna go over those resources that I talked about as we we're going through the presentation. Um, these are really handy resources. Uh, the first one here is foodsafety.gov, and this is the U.S. government's website about food safety, and it contains a ton of helpful information. Uh, it's really explained in this easy-to-understand language for the most part, so it's quite accessible to almost everyone. And this is really one of my go-to places for food safety tips that I know are going to be reputable, because, you know, it's from the U.S. government, you know, they've been vetted. Then there's Taste Atlas. This is a really cool website that I didn't, you know, have any mentions to during the presentation, but this is a great way to explore food from around the world and, you know, learn about new dishes that you may not have heard about before. And I'll actually do a little screen grab of it. Uh, this is cool enough I want to show you. So it's literally just a map full of food 
and you can zoom into different areas of the world and actually click on some of these dishes. Uh, some will give you information about the dishes, even sometimes recipes, uh, and sometimes some history too. So for those of you, you know, perhaps who have an anime identity, um, you know, a lot of those are based in Japan. So you, know, you can go through and learn about, for instance, gyoza or the Koho, Kyoho grape, whatever you want. Um, so here I'm going to click on one. So this is the gyoza, and you can scroll down and see, you know, there's some information about it, things that it goes with, things it's made with. Um, just really, really cool information. And, you know, you can do this for anywhere in the world. Uh, this is also really great for, you know, non-altered uh, human or non-human stuff as well. You know, if you're going to go on a trip and you want to learn about, you know, some regional cuisine, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, even, you know, in areas I'm really familiar with, I always find dishes that I've never heard of. So, for instance, you know, if I wanted to go, you know, visit Europe, um, I could, you know, click on some of these dishes and, you know, perhaps I'd want to try this. You know, who knows? Uh, so then another um, website that's really awesome, or I guess blog, uh, is KinFood. So this is a Tumblr blog, and uh, this is, um, you know, probably one of the best resources online for identity-related food. Um, you know, has recipes, you know, coming out your ears. There's all kinds of videos. Um, there's tags for every identity imaginable. Uh, it even has things like garbage, bones, raw meat alternatives, and, you know, some conversations about what's safe and what is not safe to eat. Um, there's even a post about uh, unsavory food requests, um, you know, like some of the stuff I mentioned before. And then finally, I put together a list of safe meats and where to get them a while back, and I figured it'd be useful to put up on my website, so you're welcome to visit that too if you're interested. So I really appreciate your, uh, you tuning in. I you know, appreciate your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me at you know, these links listed, or you know, we'll have about you know, 10 or 15 minutes for a quick Q&A session at the end, uh, hopefully through voice chat or text chat. So thank you so much, and uh, we'll see if you have any questions.